These are the highest IQ moments in NASCAR history. I'm talking about high profile drivers sandbagging, coming up with genius strategies, and being able to predict events before they ever even happen. Whenever you get wrecked in NASCAR, there's no need to lose hope so quickly. After getting turned by Mark Martin in the 2011 Daytona preseason race, Kyle Busch spent the whole duration of the caution making repairs to his car on pit road. The field gets lined up to go green once again, but wait, who is that? Just before the race gets restarted, Kyle Busch leaves his pit stall, runs at max speed to catch up to the pack, and times his run perfectly to pass every single car in the field as they pass the start-finish line. Speed. I am speed. Whoa, up the outside, here comes Kyle! All the way to the front, he hung back and got a slingshot restart, shades of Richard Petty, and look at this! He goes to the lead, but he has no help, can he stay there? Keep in mind, this is a race car that just got wrecked only a few laps ago. A brilliant and well-timed move put him right back in the mix. Every driver and every spotter must have had their jaws on the floor with this genius move putting Kyle Busch from last to first in the span of only 10 seconds. And you're gonna wanna stay to the end of this video for this 1 million IQ mind game moment that I've included. Shout out to NASCAR Reddit as most of these moments were formed based on some very interesting threads they created. Well done to you guys. Another genius way that a NASCAR driver thought outside the box to pass other cars was a recent pass in the grass done by Tyler Reddick in the Coke 600. A huge runoff of turn 4 of the final lap looked like it was about to be wasted when you looked ahead at the two cars blocking the track. This is when Tyler Reddick decided to drive through the grass and gain two positions from Ricky Stenhouse Jr. and Michael McDowell. I absolutely love how hyped Tyler gets on the radio after knowing he just pulled a big brain move. But it wouldn't be fair for me to mention the pass in the grass without giving the nod to Dale Earnhardt who did it first. Without technically passing a car. That's not to discredit him because he did an amazing pass in the dirt at Riverside in 1987. And we can't talk about passes in the grass without mentioning this failed attempt by Eric Jones in 2017. As much as I was rooting for him, it just didn't work out. Wow! What a run off the corner! Oh, it's in the grass! Don't go in the grass! I'll be honest when I say I don't know for sure if Charlotte Motor Speedway had the new AstroTurf in 2017, but I don't think they did as the road course configuration was not yet in use. And that's exactly how Tyler Reddick got away with his. It's much easier to drive on synthetic AstroTurf than real grass. And at most tracks, the grass technically isn't out of bounds or even at risk of being a penalty. Unless you're Chase Briscoe. Oh my god, bro. Oh, hell no, man. What the fuck? There have been times where crew chiefs have thought outside the box to purposely give up spots on pit road. I bet you're thinking to yourself, how would this make any sense? Well, the order leaving pit road is also what determines the race restart order. So if you're the second car off pit road, you restart as the first car in the outside lane. For tracks like Martinsville, you guessed it, this is less than ideal. After Jeff Gordon took a stop under caution at Martinsville of 2013, he sandbagged to give second place to one Pablo Montoya, meaning Jeff Gordon now gets to restart second car on the inside lane, aka the preferred line. This trick proved to work because as the race resumed, the inside lane was so overpowered that Jeff Gordon ended up passing Montoya even though he restarted behind him. Sadly, or maybe happily for some, this strategy will likely never be done again, as NASCAR drivers get to choose what lane they restart in each time a caution comes out. As I was making this video, I began to see just how smart Brad Keselowski and his team appeared to be. Brad was tandem drafting with Kyle Busch, and most commonly we've seen the pusher be able to set the leader up for a pass in the final stretch to steal the win. What Brad Keselowski did at the end of Talladega in 2012 was pretty astonishing. He purposely broke the draft with Kyle Busch entering turn 3 by snaking up one lane. This detached the 18 car from him and made it impossible for him to reconnect. Thankfully, they had a big enough lead on third place or this may not have worked out quite as well. Kyle Busch was interviewed after the race and told just how confused he was, even giving credit to Kozlowski on his race winning move. It was just a race between him and I and somehow getting into turn 3 I just got disconnected from him and um, once, once that happened the race was over, it was all his, so not sure if he did anything, if he did he's pretty smart. Jeff Burton exposed a loophole in the system at Charlotte in 2002. I won't spend too much time on it because I covered it in this video, but basically, all drivers were required to pit before the segment ended in the race. And Jeff Burton did so with only a few meters to spare because his pit stall was located just before the start finish line. After getting serviced by his pit crew, he could then jump over the finish line just a few stalls away and keep a ton of track position. For a little bit more about this, check out NASCAR 1 in a Million Moments from just a few months ago. 
I think this next moment is just going to prove that over time, NASCAR teams will always have small workarounds when it comes to the rules. NASCAR sometimes holds competition cautions early in certain races, in which they always inform the teams beforehand. Competition cautions really only have one clear rule. You can pit before it happens, but you can't add any fuel during the stop. If teams could just service their cars normally, everyone would try pitting before the competition caution, or they would just lose track position. That's where Harvick's crew chief Rodney Childers had the great idea to put on tires before the caution came out. Since Indianapolis is such a big track, you can pit under green and probably not go a lap down. From here, Harvick could stay out during the competition caution, and when everyone else came to pit, he would cycle to the front. Originally, he pitted from 9th place, so he essentially got the lead for free and also the benefit of clean air. Kevin Harvick was leading and Clint Boyer was trailing right behind him as stage 2 ended in the race. The weather in the area was looking to get bad in a hurry, and Boyer's crew chief made the call to come in and take only two right side tires. The rest of the field took four, but the 14 team had to try something to take the lead. While two tires is technically a disadvantage, the 14 team figured they'd only have to make it work for a handful of laps until the rainstorm eventually hit. To their surprise, something even better happened. Da -da. Battle for the race on the right against Mother oh. Nature, and Ricky Stenhouse in turn two is in the wall. Ricky Stenhouse spun out and created a caution even sooner, and as Boyer was leading. Immediately following, the rain rolled in, and since the race was over halfway done, it was called, and Boyer's team won on an all-or-nothing two-tire strategy call. In the 2013 Richmond race, a caution came out late, leaving the race up to who would win a two-lap dash. The first three cars elected not to pit, while the next two cars took just two right side tires. Before this caution, Kevin Harvick was leading, but now he's going to restart seventh. But the thing is, he was the first car on four fresh tires. With there being only two laps left, no one expected fresh tires to make that big of a difference. Except for the four team. Harvick shot from 7th to the lead in the span of only one of those two laps. And if crew chief Gil Martin made the final call, he looked insanely smart for it. My favorite part about this is the commentators were so focused on Carl Edwards with two tires, Kevin Harvick snuck by and they hardly noticed it. There, there goes Carl on the outside, he's got a nice run. How about Kevin Harvick in that 29er? That's his teammate he's chasing. McMurray got caught out, but way up the hill. Here they come to turn three. Now for the 1 million IQ moment I promised at the beginning of this video. In the 1974 Firecracker 400, David Pearson was leading but purposely let Richard Petty by on the final lap of the race. This is because he knew the car in second has a huge advantage thanks to the draft. Giving the lead away on the last lap is quite the gamble, but Pearson made it work as he timed his pass perfectly to retake the lead and win the race. This is the type of stuff you do in GTA Online racing because of the over-exaggerated slipstream, but David Pearson with the 1 million IQ to make sure he thought of every possible outcome in this situation. Well Chris, I knew that uh, if I let him stay behind me that he would draft me and beat me, so I just backed off right there at the, last flag, or the white flag and let him go on by, then I got him back, coming off the floor. And finally, the highest IQ moment of all time has got to be when Lightning McQueen stuck his tongue out on Cars 1 to tie Chick Hicks and the King. If we wanted to do a zero IQ moments video, I need you to list in the comments some of the most embarrassing low IQ moments in all of NASCAR. I'll even make sure to credit your ideas. Hit subscribe, or not, that's completely your choice, but if you're not yet convinced, check out one more video and maybe make your decision there.